Hey, how many of you glad to be at church? Say amen. amen. And it's a beautiful day outside. Uh, I am excited about I got to hurry and dive into this because I could preach this today all day long. And uh, there are people coming in at 1130 that want to hear it, too. So I'm going to try to get into it as quick as I can. Uh, we're in week three of a series called Ghost, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And for some of you, depending on the, the background that you have in church, if you have any background, then, then any time you hear the word Holy Spirit, you typically have one of two reactions. You're either like, oh, that guy, or you're like, oh, that guy. Uh, because the Holy Spirit, depending, again, on your background, is, is either the third part of the Trinity that we don't talk that much about, or is the third part of the Trinity that we only talk about. And, and neither one are healthy. There's a, there's a place in the middle where I feel like the Holy Spirit fits as the third person in the Godhead. And so today we're going to talk, last week we talked about this idea of the Holy Spirit working in us. That the Holy Spirit working in us does a couple things. The first thing He does is He, he changes us. That's the, the sanctification part of it. That, that the Holy Spirit is constantly working to make us who God would have us to be. Second thing that He does is He directs us. He gives us direction. He helps us find which way we need to go. And then the third thing is this, is that He gives us peace. He comforts us. How, how many of you have been in seasons where it's been just chaotic and you needed something more than any person could offer you? And the Spirit of God comes in and does that. Now, you may be here this morning and say, Pastor Vince, I get it. I've heard the talk. I've watched the Easter story, seen the Christmas story. I know about Jesus. I know about the Father and the Son. I don't know much about this Holy Ghost person. Well, you're not alone. A lot of people in the church don't know a lot about the Holy Ghost. There's actually a book that came out a few years ago by an author named Francis Chan, and he titled the book The Forgotten God because of how little the Holy Spirit gets talked about. And we just thought it was fair that we needed to dive into just it, it really just give a series in regards to what the Holy Spirit does. And so as we talk through some of this stuff today, it's going to be new for some of you. Some of it's going to be uh, repeated for some of you, and some of you just may know. You're further down the road than, than, than I am. And so you, you may hear today and go, man, had that, knew that. That was great. But I, I hope today is a blessing to you. I hope that I don't put you to sleep. And I hope that you have a beautiful rest of the day. So diving in, let me give you our theme verse. We've mentioned this. It's, we've been talking about this verse for about the last two months because this verse is really powerful. And Jesus came into the room with them and said, peace be with you. Okay, peace be with you. And, and he said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So Jesus gives us this premise. He says, hey, just like God sent me to earth to give this redemption story, I'm sending you to go tell the redemption story. But then he says, he finishes it and he says, as he is saying this, he breathed upon them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Just as the Father sent the Spirit down like a dove, when Jesus was baptized, you being saved, received the Holy Spirit in your life so that you could accomplish the mission that God has for your life. God has a mission for your life. And let me just be very clear with you. There's going to be a few moments today where I say something very direct. And if you're not used to direct conversation, it may throw you. I don't say them to upset you. I say them so I'm clear. You cannot accomplish the mission of God for your life without the Spirit of God empowering you to do so. You can't do it. You may do some great things. You may do some nice things. You may do some special things. You may do some of the most considerate things this planet has ever known. But if it's not the, God, the Spirit of God empowering you, then you have yet to accomplish the mission of God in your life. And so today, last week we talked about what He does in us. Today I want to talk to you about how He works through you. Okay, because here's the reality. I, I think every leader should be a learner. I think we should be constantly taking information in. But information that you take in that you don't give away isn't benefiting anyone. And so I believe the Holy Spirit works in much the same way. You may have this power given to you by the Holy Spirit, but if it is not working through you to accomplish the mission, then we're missing it still. It's the problem with what I see as the local church just as a whole is that we have the Ferrari parked in the garage. We're just not driving it. We just leave the keys on the wall, look at them every once in a while and go, I got a fast car out there. <laughs> Woo, it's fast. How do you know? I'm just, it's just fast. And sometimes that's what we think about the Holy Spirit. We know He's there. We're not really sure all that He's capable of because it scares us a little bit. The reality is He's aching to be a part of your life. 
And it's critical in the church world and critical in any part of your life to be led by the Holy Spirit. He said, Pastor Vince, what does that mean? It's kind of crazy. I can remember in ministry myself being raised in church, but not knowing until later. I felt early on God was calling me to ministry, that he was, he was trying to lead me to a direction. And as he was leading me, I was saying no. As he was leading me, I would say, let me try this. And, let me, and I, I did children's ministry for a while. And I, I did that for a season. And, and that was awesome. I loved doing kids' ministry, man. It was a blast to be sitting there. There'd be a two-year-old on the front row with his knuckle deep in his nose while you're trying to preach to him. And he's picking his nose and wiping it on the kid next to him. And you're like, this is a spiritual moment right here. I know some of you are like, that happens in children's church? It happens in every service, okay? Uh, you'd be amazed at what I see from this perspective looking out at you all, all right? But I, I, I just battled with, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what do you want me to do? How many of you, let me just ask this way, how, how many of you know there is a Holy Spirit? Say amen. amen. How many of you know exactly what he wants you to do? Say amen. <laughs> Did you hear the difference? It's because we know who he is, but we're a, little, we're a little afraid to access him. And so today I want to tell you how he works through you. We're going to talk about gifts today. We're going to talk about how they, how they function in you, how you can utilize them. Um, but there's no way I can go through each individual gift. All right, this is going to be impossible. So if you're going to take notes today, today would be the day to do it. If you want to take pictures of the screen as the stuff comes up, then take pictures of the screen. If you take pictures of me, get me when I'm walking this way. This is my better side. Okay. <laughs> or just get me straight on, then you don't see this side. <laughs> um, uh, so we're going to dive into this today, and I pray that it's a blessing to you. The screen says, the slide says three ways the Holy Spirit works through you. We're not going to get through three. All right, I barely got through two in the first service because there's so much stuff. And so we're going to get through two of them today as best I can. So diving into it, let's go ahead and jump right in and talk about the, the ways. The first way the Holy Spirit of God works through you. The first way is this, supernatural gifts. Okay, People hear this, and again, depending on your background, if you're a Baptist, you're like, oh, snap, he just said supernatural. Yes, yeah, stuff's about to get weird. Okay, Now, now they're really scared. Now, we're not going to get weird. I want to walk you through it. Supernatural, don't get it confused. Because confusion is not of the Lord. That's according to Scripture. That's a Scripture. God is not the author of confusion. And so this thing about the Holy Spirit, you know what the devil has done? The devil has done a, an amazing job of keep, people, keeping people confused about the Holy Spirit. And because they're confused about the Holy Spirit, they don't tap into it. They just stay away from it. Why? Because I don't really know what he's going to do. I, I mean, I've seen some stuff on TV. It kind of freaks me out a little bit. I understand that. So when I say supernatural gift, what I mean is there is the Spirit of God that is accomplishing something beyond your ability. Beyond your ability. It means the Spirit of God has come in and He's empowered you to do something beyond anything you thought you could do or you were even maybe talented to do. And so as we dive into this, we're going to see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to start there. It says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of services, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, and this is all written to a church, okay? There are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. In everyone. So look at the person next to you right now and say, you got a gift. Okay. Look at the person on the other side of you and go, but mine's better. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Just making sure you're still with me. All right. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. For what? The common good. Each gift is given to the church for the common good of the church. Each gift is given to you for the building up and the edifying of the church. That's why you have it. That's what your spiritual gift is for, to affect the spiritual part of your life. The church is where your gift is supposed to be lived out. A lot of people say, no, 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 this, this, I got, I, this is what I do. This is what I'm really good at. That's awesome. I'm glad you're really good at that, but it may not be a gift. It may just be a talent. And they're different. And we'll get there in just a second, but I want to walk through this gift list as quickly as I can. And as I said, I'm going to give you the places where they're found 
So if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you four places in Scripture where the gift lists are found. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to condense them into categories because there's just too many. All right, so here we go. The list of gifts, gi the list of gifts. That's hard to say if you have a lisp. We had to mop the stage after the first service. I spit everywhere. Y'all pray for me today, all right? The list of gifts in the New Testament are found in these places. Romans chapter 12. Ephesians chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And three different times in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And it's a list. There's a list, man. Hospitality, leadership, administration, helps, mercy. I mean, good grief. There's a list of things that are there. Pastor, preacher, teacher, apostle, evangelist. Man, there's a list of things that are there. And if I tried to take each one of them apart, we'd be here until next year this time. And so what I want to do is I want to kind of categorize them. And I'm going to give you some categories to walk through. And here we go. So I'm going to dive into it. The first set of gifts is this. They're the guiding gifts. The guiding gifts are like this. These are people who are all about seeing stuff get done. They want to see results. They want to see what happens at the end of it. These gifts look like this. Pastor, apostle, leadership, and administration. And I want to just tell you real quick so that you understand. Just because you hold this role in a church doesn't mean you are gifted to be a pastor. If I were going to tell you something about myself, it would be this. I do not have a pastor gift. I love that I get to pastor a church, but I do not have a pastor gift. I'm wired more like an apostle. I'm a builder. Like that's, that's what I do. I like to see things start, and then I like to go start new things. Hey, my, my ministry looked a lot like this. When I, this year, this April, actually the 1st of April, uh, I, I celebrate 20 years in the ministry. I've been doing this 20 years now. And so in April, I was looking back and realized that I started my pastoring journey in Melbourne, Arkansas. I was there about three years, and I left. Everything was good. It just felt I was getting restless, and I said, I got to go. And then I went when I was a youth pastor and a worship leader for about 18 months. And after about 18 months, I started getting restless, and, and I didn't want to do that anymore. And so I moved again, and I took a church in Batesville, Arkansas. And I was at that church about three years. And as I was there about three years, my heart started getting restless again. And God called me and Jennifer to start Real Life Church in Flippin', Arkansas. And guess what? After about two and a half years, I started getting restless. And we were allowed to, we were, God allowed us to start Real Life Church Mountain Home. And then about three years in, we moved from our bus garage to a horse barn that sits right next to this building. And then about two and a half years in, we built a building right here. And so I'm sitting there going, this is fantastic. Well, guess what? We have four years coming up in September in this building. Wait, hold on. Hold on. Some of you are like, yeah. And some of you are like, oh, snap. Where is he going? I'm not leaving. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Because here's how good God is when he gifts you this way. See, about a year ago, right as COVID started, we opened the Reach Center. And last October, we launched Real Life Gainesville. And so God, in his grace, said, I said, God, I love building things. That's how you wired me. That's how you gifted me. I want to go build something. He was like, I don't want you to go anywhere. I'm like, I can't keep building here. I know some of you are like, we got four acres. What else you want to build? I'm not building anything else. <laughs> this will be the biggest auditorium that Real Life Church ever has. So we're like, oh man. Now we may have 27 services a weekend in it. <laughs> None of my staff said amen. <laughs> They're like, oh, hold on, do we get a vote? Uh, but God said, I, I, I need you to stay, but I, I'm going to let you build. Because I know your heart and I know how I gifted you and I know where I need you in this season. For some of you, we look at these guiding gifts and that's just exactly what these are. The gifts to lead, to, to, to build something, to create something, to pastor someone, to walk them through, to be that shepherd in, in the valley of the shadow of death, to be that kind of personality. That's more, there are people that are wired like that and man, I have prayed, God give me that gift. And in some ways he's made me a little better at it, but some ways it's still so foreign to me because I'm constantly thinking about how do I build the next thing. That's how he built me. That's how he wired me. It's not bad. It's just a different gift set. And so we have the guiding gifts that are here. The next one we have influencing gifts. Now probably if I were going to tell you my number one gift, the greatest gift that God has given me is my gift to preach. 
I don't say that in arrogance. This is just easy. Like this is just, just easy. And for some of you, you know what that is. So an influencing gift looks like this. It's teaching, evangelism, preaching, or prophecy. And the list, you're going to find them in different places, but they all fit under the influencing gift. How many of you know people that would you, that you would consider are magnets? Like when they're around, people want to be around them. Anybody know anybody like that? It's an in, if, they, if they are following Christ and the Spirit is given in that gift, they probably have this type of influencing gift. I'm not, I was going to start preaching on something, but i got to wait a second. I'll get there in a second. Next one, fellowship gifts. These are people that say, I want healthy relationships. They really care about, care about the connections between people in the body. It's one of the reasons we do life groups, and, and I, don't, I don't do life. I'm in life groups. I love the connection, of life, but I don't lead the life groups ministry here at the church. There's people that are really, that, that's their gifting is that they love connection and how do we get people connected? How do we do those kind of things? How do we get them plugged in? That's their gift set. And so we're so thankful that the people have that fellowship gift. They're not so concerned about the result so long as we get there in a healthy way. And so that's what that fellowship gift looks like. Task gifts. How many of you remember the CCR song, Put Me In Coach? Put me in coach. I'm ready to play today. Yeah, I, I grew up playing baseball, so like I loved that song. When it came on the radio, I was like, yes, this is a baseball song. Everybody should listen to this song. And so, but that's the reality of the task gift. These are the, these are the doers. These are the people that get, you want me to hold a sign? I'll hold a sign. You want me to park cars? I'll park cars. I told them in the first service, you give Joe, the guy that works in the parking lot, if you give Joe two orange sticks, that dude turns into a ninja. But have you, how many of you know who I'm talking about, Joe out there parking cars? How many of you know that that dude does that with so much joy? Amen. Like, man, he has a ball out there when he's doing that. But that's how he's wired. That's how he's gifted. Joe and his wife, they came to the church for quite a while. And he was sitting there, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. We put orange sticks in his hand and he turns into a different monster. <laughs> like, you could see him light up and he's out there yelling across and kids are running through the parking lot to give Joe a hug. And I'm like, how in the world? He found his gift. He found it. He found that I can be this person that's encouraging, that I have the gift of helps, of giving, of encouragement, of craftsmanship and intercession. I can do this. This right here, this gift, this task gift is the backbone of every church. It's the backbone, straight up backbone. People ask, if we, run, if we run full staff in all of our volunteer slots for a Sunday morning at just this location, we need somewhere between 100 and 150 volunteers. That's how much it takes to make a Sunday three services go. Some of those people serve all three services. The worship teams here starts at 7 a.m. in the morning. Okay? And they get here and they run through and they get ready so that it's good for you guys. And the tech team is here doing their thing so it's good for you guys. And children's ministry is ready to go to be those hands and feet that love your kids. And, and the people that work in the host area, whether they're serving tea or they're holding the sign or they're handing them a mask in the 830 or taking yours away in the 10 o'clock and the 1130, whichever it is, they are serving just saying, what do you need me to do? Where do I fit? How can I best use this gift that is within me? The last one is this, the support gifts. Support gifts look like this. They're wisdom, they're knowledge, discernment, faith. These are people that want to reinforce other gifts in other people. The best story of this, the best illustration of this in the New Testament is a guy named Barnabas. If you've ever studied the New Testament, how many of you heard the name Paul? Yeah, he wrote most of it. It's a pretty big name in the Bible. All right, Barnabas is the guy that was with Paul. And if you study Paul's journeys out, what you see is this trend. It's listed as Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. And then something happens. And now it's Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas. And then something happens. They get this little punk kid working with him named John Mark. And John Mark is there and Paul does not jive with John Mark. He's like, he's a punk. That's not biblical. He doesn't call him a pumpkin in the Bible. But he kind of does. He's like, he's not useful. He's not helping us at all. So just go ahead and leave him here. And then another shift happens in the Bible. And we see Barnabas and John Mark go. 
And Paul picks up another gentleman named Silas who begins the journey with him. Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas. And I'll tell you what, what happens at the end of the New Testament is Paul is writing this letter to Timothy. And he's like, Timothy, I need my coat and I need my paper so that I can continue to write letters. And I need my books so that I can continue to reference so that I'm writing the right thing to Ephesus and to Colossians and to the Corinthians and the Philippians. And and I need my stuff. And then he says, and... Please send me John Mark, for he is profitable to the ministry of God. What happened? Barnabas. Barnabas, whose name didn't have to be first, went wherever the support was needed most and filled that. Let me tell you, church, if you're ever in a church setting and someone comes to you and says, you are a Barnabas, you have a Barnabas gift, it is the highest compliment within the walls of the church. I have several here. Kirby, how many of you know Kirby Brown? Raise your hand. Okay. Kirby Brown is my executive pastor. He's been on staff here for years. He's been with us since the beginning of Mountain Home, was with us in Flippin', and most people don't know Kirby. That's because right now he's outside filling a baptistry because somebody said, hey, I want to be baptized and I'd like to do it today. And Kirby and the team went, let's do it today. And they're filling that to make it happen in the 1130 service because that's who he is. I was going to call him up here, but I can't. Why? Because he's supporting the ministry. And he doesn't care if you know what he looks like or who he is, because that's just who he is. The support gifts are critical. Typically, these people, as I said, have wisdom, they have knowledge, they have discernment. But there are some misconceptions about these supernatural gifts. And this is where it's going to throw some of you. Misconceptions are this, is that these gifts are only for some people. Well, like if you're a preacher, then you need the gift of preaching. If, you need, if, you, if, you need, if, you're, a pre, if you're a pastor, then, then you better have the patent. They're not for just some people. You can be sitting right out there, never pastoring a church, and have the pastoring gift. Because it just means you shepherd people. It just means you shepherd folks. You can be a missionary that never is a missionary, whether that's you're an apostle that goes to Africa or to Mountain Home, Arkansas, or maybe you're an apostle that goes to Walmart. And you work your second shift there and you share the love of Jesus Christ and you are building and you're a building in the people around you. Or maybe, maybe you've just not stopped long enough to ask God, Lord, what is my gift? What is my gift? They're not just for some people, they're for everybody. Every one of you that has said yes to Jesus Christ, you have a gift. You have one. He put one in you. The moment you said yes, he looked at an angel and he was like, watch this. And he put it in you so that you could accomplish the mission that God has for your life. And what a beautiful thing. Second misconception is this, is that they are the same as the fruit of the Spirit. How many of you know what the fruit of the Spirit is? Love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. Let me just burst your bubble right now. You do not have the gift of patience. Some of you are like, amen. Amen. You're right, Pastor Vince, I don't. But also, let me tell you this. If you don't have patience, it's because you haven't let the Spirit produce it in your life. Because the Spirit, those are the fruit. You guys know how fruit gets here, right? It's produced off a tree. This is the fruit of the Spirit. And he says, all of these things are fruit that the Spirit will produce in your life when you give Him access to your life. Joy, kindness, meekness, gentleness, self-control. That's a fruit of the Spirit. If you don't have self-control, don't look at God and say, Lord, give me self-control. Because He's going to look back and go, you've always had it. You're just not using it. I put my Spirit in you. You have everything that you need to accomplish what I've given you to accomplish. Tap into it. The fruit of the Spirit and the gift of the Spirit is different. The next misconception is this. Gifts are not the same as natural talent or your personality. Do you know this is not a gift to be a singer? See? Dallas isn't gifted by God to sing. 
Now, Dallas has been given a talent by God, but his talent has very little to do with his accomplishing God's mission for his life. Now, what Dallas's gift is, is he falls in that influencing category. Because if you get around Dallas's team, they love this dude. He is just, look at him. <laughs> but also when Dallas sings a song, he has the ability to take you right into the moment with him. And if he's crying, half of you are crying. I know some of you are like, yeah, he sure does. Because that's a gift. God gave him the gift to influence. He just uses his talent to do it. There's a difference. This isn't, you, people. well, I'm gifted to talk to people. No, you just talk to people. The gift has to accomplish the mission of God. I've been gifted to talk. If you'd have asked teachers in my first grade class, I was looking through report cards a few weeks ago from my kindergarten. Kindergarten. I'm learning V is for velvet. And my teacher's like, Vince loves to communicate with everybody in the classroom. He won't sit down. He won't be quiet. And I'm like, hater. And that's what I said. <laughs> my ability to communicate, I'm going to do that no matter what. My ability to influence and to share the gospel in a way that comes out as proclaiming the gospel, preaching, presenting the gospel. That's the gift. Your gift is not because of who you, well, Vince, I'm an, I'm an introvert, so I could never be a preacher. No, that's not the case. John on Patmos was on an island alone writing the book of Revelation. Think he talked to a lot of people? Think his extrovert was wearing himself out? And, no. Now you talk about Paul, Paul's a little different. Paul gets in a prison cell and they strap a guard to him. Paul's like, hey, we're going to talk. We're going to talk today, and then I'm going to talk to your partner when you get off. And the whole prison ends up getting saved because Park, and Paul's just rattling, just doing Peter, he's an extrovert in the Bible. And sometimes it gets him in trouble. No, it's not about your personality. It's not because you're shy or bold. It's not because you're, you're introvert or extrovert. That has nothing to do with your gifting. Your gift came straight from the Holy Spirit to empower you to accomplish the mission of God. Last thing. Not only does God give you these supernatural gifts for the edification and the building up of the church, but the Spirit is also the thing that gives us supernatural wholeness. Wholeness, me and you. I want you to listen to how much Paul repeats himself in this passage because it's really important that you hear it. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit have we all baptized into one body, Jews, Greeks, slave, or free, it doesn't matter. And we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not exist or does not consist of one member, but of many. Look at the person next to you and say, you're part of the body. Yeah, you're part of the body. He says, because I am not a hand, if the foot would say this, if the foot would say, I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. Well, that wouldn't make the foot any less part of the body, right? Just because it said so. Or if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. That would not make the ear any less part of the body. And then I love how Paul changes it in 17. He's like, listen, if your whole body was an eye, there's one big eye out here. Do y'all ever read the Bible like that? Like sometimes we spiritualize it and we're like, Paul's just giving this eloquent. No, I think Paul's getting frustrated. You know, parents, you understand this, right? Because you get to the point where people are like, well, I want to go hang out with my friends. I'm going to go ahead. And you're like, if your friend jumped off a cliff. Right? How many of you parents? Come on. Don't leave me alone. Paul is having that moment right here where he was like, if your foot wants to be a hand, that doesn't make any sense. And if your ear wants to be an eye, and I think the people were at Corinthians were like, what is he saying? And Paul's like, if your whole body's an eye, that doesn't make any sense. Where would the sense of hearing be? If your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. 
Did you hear that? Each one of you in the body, as Christ said, I need you to go to real life this morning. I don't, why would I go to real life? Their music's loud, their preacher's gonna spit and sweat, it's gonna be bad, I don't wanna go there. It's not that funny. I want you to go there, why? Because God's building a toolbox. Because I believe that every gift that this church needs to accomplish the mission that this church was given to do is in this room. But not everybody's accessed it. Not everybody's accessed it. He says, if the whole body, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? If all of us were preachers, Sundays would be really long. And nobody would want to sit out there. We'd all want to do our thing up here. He says, that's not how it works. As it is. There are many parts, one body. The Spirit gives gifts to the church to build the church. Health, wholeness, growth, and life happens when the church is healthy, when people are engaged in their gifts, when you're using what God has given you. But just like I gave you the misconceptions about the first set of gifts, I have to give you the misconception about spiritual wholeness. And this is going to hurt. The misconception is this. I can be a fully devoted Christ follower without being connected to a local church. No, Vince, I, I mean, I'm part of the big C. Nope. Nope. Not if you read the Bible. You start in Acts chapter 2 where the beginning of the local church is founded and you can see it throughout the entire scripture, the entire rest of the Bible. There is a necessity for the people of God to be connected in community with the people of God. It's a non-negotiable. You say, well, it's negotiable. No. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as some people do, but you should be doing it more as the day of my return draws closer. We got to be together. We got to not just be together. We got to be doing ministry together. What God has gifted you with is critical for this to be healthy and whole. Don't be sitting on it waiting for something to happen. Well, if somebody will ask me, then I'll get involved. That's not how it works. Jump in. Jump in. Who knows? You never will know unless you ask, unless you get involved, unless you sign up to see where can God use me? Whether you're holding a sign, whether you come in on Thursday and answer the phone and help us get ready. I have a whole team of people that help me with sermons and we walk through stuff and it's awesome to be able to work with the body to accomplish the mission. Because I want you to be a part of it. I don't want you to just be an outlier. Somebody sitting out here, you know, Here's, the, here's where this misconception turns, and I'm going to close. Modern church has taught us to be consumers. Feed me. If I don't feel fed, then I'm leaving. It's a pretty anti-biblical thought in all reality. It's because as a believer and as someone who is gifted, your role is to be feeding. Is to be feeding. Oh, sure, the sermon can feed you, absolutely. The worship can feed you, absolutely. But you get filled for one purpose, to pour it out. You're filled to pour it out. You're filled to pour it out. I dare you. One of you call me this afternoon at 2 o'clock. You want an incoherent conversation after preaching three sermons? I'm most likely just going to babble on the blah, 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 blah. Because my brain doesn't work. I pour everything I have out in three, three times on Sunday morning. Because I got nothing left when it's done. Why? Because God said, Vince, this is your part of the body. I don't need you to do anything spectacular. I just need you to be who I've asked you to be and who I've gifted you to be. And I'll take care of the rest. 
because He fills me and then I pour it out. What are you pouring out? What of the Spirit in your life are you pouring out for someone else? Or are you just being filled?